place to hide the sweet sweet I try with all my mind I just can't win the fight I'm slowly Just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know. He told me that I was not alone. You picked me up, turned me around, seized my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you healed my heart, changed my name. Welcome to church. Welcome to Calvary. We're glad you're here today to worship the Lord, to thank the Lord just what we did there for his goodness, for his mercy on our life, for Jesus who paid it all for us. It's the reason we're here to celebrate. So join in today. Join in and worship. Let's hear the word. Let's receive the word as the Bible teaches us. Come on, let's continue to worship here. Let's ask the Holy Spirit to do something amazing. Let's come with a heart of worship in this place. I'm coming with a heart of worship. I'm bringing in a brand new song. I'm ready to see the unthinkable. I'm ready for a miracle. Hearts praying for a fresh encounter, souls looking to the living God. I'm 
Would you pray with me? Just for a moment, we ask the Holy Spirit to do a work among us. Our counselor to come, our helper to be present here. So that we can't experience that freedom. So Lord Jesus, would you move among us. The Holy Spirit be felt here today. Correct the errors of our ways if we need it. As we set our mind towards you and you alone. God, we need you today. It's in Jesus' we, name we pray. Amen. You guys have a seat. Good morning, Calvary. I am so glad to see you today. We continue to have lots of guests, and we're continuing to grow. If you look around and you don't know somebody, and they're like, why aren't you talking to them? They may be a guest as well. So introduce yourself as we continue to grow. And we want you to get plugged in. We want you to know 
that there are different ways to get plugged in. You can find all of this at yourcalvary.info, but there's women's Bible studies starting soon. There's men's Bible studies starting Wednesday night at 8. There is student community, which meets for middle school and high school tonight. There is Merge, which is the college age group that meets for lunch today, brief lunch today after the second service. But there's places to get connected. There's community for you to get involved in. And the community isn't just for you to have friendships, but it's a community that's designed intentionally to help us walk closer to God. And in doing so, we will walk closer to each other. So get involved. As we're starting our new series, or last week Drew started the new series, on Dear, uh, Sincerely Paul, we went back and forth between Dear Paul and Sincerely Paul, we're co- covering different books uh, that Paul wrote and what was the purpose of it. So we're trying to cover almost an entire book in a very short time. So let's fasten our seatbelts and let's get going. We're, today we're covering the book of Galatians. And the book of Galatians was written to the people of modern-day Turkey, this was not Israel. It was written for the purpose to address the false, false teachings of the good news of Jesus, the false teachings of the gospel. And when you think about that, what we really think is, good, this is one of those books, one of those stories that's going to affirm what I already believe and basically attack everybody else. <laughs> because here's something that has happened since the history of time. People naturally assume they are correct. You probably think you're correct about everything you think about God. But yet there's something probably you think about God that's wrong. You probably assume that everything that you do is right. And, and, and the way you vote and the way you, you operate and the way you act, and it's everybody else's fault that the world is sometimes struggling. The book of Galatians addresses that. But to get to the heart of Galatians, we have to understand what it's intended to produce And after we determine what it's intended to produce, we'll chase it through to see how we know that what we believe is aligned with what God believes, and if it doesn't, how to correct it. That's where the book of Galatians is going. So the culmination of Galatians, the heart, the purpose, is really found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. If you have your Bibles, turn with me there. I'm going to be covering quite a few verses through Galatians today, but this is always a good verse to highlight in your Bible. Galatians 5, 1 and 2 says this, For freedom Christ set us free. Stand then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Take note, I, Paul, am telling you that if you get yourselves circumcised, Christ will not benefit you at all. Now, verse 1 is kind of the theme. For freedom Christ is set free. Stand firm then and don't submit to a yoke of slavery. We are free in Christ. But what are we free from? He gives us the example of the circumcision. Okay, I'm not going to go into that too deep. But here's the basic idea. In the Old Testament, if you were a follower of Jesus, when you, um, or when follower of God, Yahweh, when you started following God, one of the signs of it of the covenant was to get circumcised. But when Jesus came, that was no longer need because the blood that Jesus poured out for us on the cross means the blood of the Old Testament was no longer necessary, if you get my drift. And so as we're doing that, as we understand what this looks like, he's saying, you don't have to get circumcised anymore to be a follower of Jesus. Paul is addressing the people of Galatia. These were not people who grew up in the Old Testament church. These were people who were coming in to the church. And the Jewish people were saying, if you want to follow our God, if you want to give your life to Jesus, you have to look like us and follow all of our traditions. And Paul was saying, well, not exactly. You see, Christ came to set us free. Now, a statement I've made around here quite often and I will continue to make is, It is very, very rare that the law will lead someone to Christ. But after you give your life to Jesus, after you surrender to following him, Jesus will point you back into the law. So the law is not bad. The law provides us boundaries. Think about it once again, like if you've ever been driving in the Colorado Rocky Mountains, right? And you're going through those roads and there's these boundaries that exist on those roads. You don't ever actually intend to hit the boundary, but I'm really glad they're there, right? 
Because if I get a, blow, a tire blowout or something, I want that protection. That's what the law is designed to do, to keep us on the path to stay focused on God. We want to have parameters, but the law is not what saves us. The law is not even our assurance of our salvation. The law is meant to make sure that we don't crash and burn. For freedom, Christ has set us free. So the law, when we put our hope in the law, if you grew up in a church where your hope was in a bunch of rules, your hope was in the listing of how much you knew about God, there's no freedom there. There's legalism. And if we look at two extremes of the way this works, I want us to see a genuine understanding of the gospel leads us to growing in a relationship with Jesus as guided by the Holy Spirit and His Word. As guided by the Holy Spirit and His Word. There's two kind of extremes that are going on in the church today, and I actually encountered both of these last week. This last week I had the privilege of speaking to a bunch of college students down at the beach. That's why I was not here last week. Unless you think that was a great thing, I actually despise the sand but that's another story another time and so um i didn't even go to the beach but i enjoyed the time with the college students and hanging out with them and stuff but one of the girls i i had a conversation with at the end of the night came to me and she was really struggling finding validity in who god was because of her father her father was one who manipulated the scriptures for his benefit or at least according to her viewpoint of what she told me and it's like, I'm the leader of this household, and everyone's going to do what I want to do, and you're going to follow and say what I, and you're not going to do this, and you're going to be this. And it was, a, in a sense, it was a spiritual abuse. Because the gospel is really about glorifying God, not using it for your power. And I think sometimes there are people in the church, far too often there's people in the church, who use the gospel as a sword to pierce others instead of knowing that the sword it's actually talking about that's supposed to pierce is down to the marrow of your bones. So there's one extreme, the legalistic people who manipulate it. And the other one is like, God loves us and no matter what happens, it's great. This was my Uber driver this week. <laughs> I picked up my Uber driver and I would say I had a great conversation with him about the gospel, but it wasn't really a conversation. He just wanted to talk. And so when I, he asked me, what are you doing? I said, I'm here preaching at a conference. And he's like, oh, that's great. You're a pastor. I used to be a Pentecostal minister. And I was like, oh, yeah, what happened? And he goes, well, I, I don't know. I really just struggled with my faith. And, and now I'm a massage therapist, Uber driver, who is a universalist. I was like, how did you get to be a universalist? And he was like, well, I just felt like if we were to be free in the spirit, it meant that we should all be free. And if, if we all should be free, then Christ came to set us all free. And if Christ came to set us all free, there's no such thing as hell. So therefore, we don't need to actually believe the Bible because you see how the, it just kind of keeps going. So let me read that statement again. A genuine understanding of the gospel leads to a growing relationship with Jesus as guided by the Holy Spirit and his word. The Holy Spirit and His Word. His Word reveals what God has said, and the Holy Spirit does that as well. And ultimately, what it's about is a relationship. The freedom that we have is resting in the relationship with God. And so we are intimately connected to the Father through Jesus' death on the cross. Our hope and our freedom is not found in a book, but in the God that the book talks about in the relationship that we were made to be. Just as my hope and my relationship is not found in the wedding license that my wife and I signed, it's in the relationship lived out. Right? Now, God's word is true, and we can trust it. And I'll take God's word any day over actually my wedding license, and my wife would echo that, okay? But what the book is about is pointing us to God. We can trust it. But our salvation isn't in a bunch of rules. It's in a relationship. So the way this works is Jesus came down. Emmanuel, God came with us. The Christmas story that led to the Easter story. God himself dwelt in human form in the form of Jesus, the Son. The Son of God. And he lived a perfect life. Why? Because we were separated from God because of this thing called sin. We did what we wanted to do. And in the separation of the holiness of God, because we were selfish and we do what we want to do, right? We needed a way to get back into that right relationship with God. So when Jesus died for us, he paid for our sins with his very life. And he was buried in a tomb for three days. He was resurrected 
he beat death. We know this is true because ain't nobody found nobody. And the Easter story shows us that Christ is still alive. And because Christ is still alive, he is knowable. He is uh, able for us to understand what it looks like to walk with. And our freedom comes when we're in the relationship with him. You ever been in a relationship that's been really good? And you know the freedom that you feel in that? You ever been in a relationship that doesn't feel free? Why does it not feel free? Because we get distracted and because we get selfish and same with our relationship with God. So to understand how we chase after Jesus, because this is the point, the freedom that we follow in God is found by chasing after Jesus, let me cover real quickly something called the Trinity, okay? The Trinity is a doctrine that we believe that I can't really cover real quickly. I took an entire semester of this and the professor said the first day that when you walk out of here, you will probably be more confused than when you walk in. Yet, we can know certain aspects of the Trinity that give us assurance of our faith while understanding that God is bigger than us, fully comprehending. You follow me? So God is one. And from that one, there are three essences. Some people would say persons. Some people would say all of those have different problems with them, but the, here's the idea. God is one. We worship one God who has the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Those three things work in unison as one, okay? And so as a follower of Jesus, here's how this works. We look to the Father, we pray to the Father in our prayer life. We say, God, the Father, what do you want me to do? Our example of that is found in by looking to Jesus. So when we talk, say around here, we're followers making followers of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is God in human form. We can know what Jesus looks like because he walked on the earth. We can know what God looked like because he walked on the earth in the form of Jesus. So we chase after Jesus. Yet when Jesus went away, he said, behold, I'm leaving you a counselor. The counselor is the Holy Spirit. Now, different denominations have different views on the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you what I believe is biblically accurate. You look to Jesus, but allow the Holy Spirit to thrive in your life. Very, very rare. I was reading the Lord's Prayer again this morning. It says, you pray to the Father looking to Jesus in the name of Jesus, but allow the Holy Spirit to arise. So the Holy Spirit then is the way that we know the relationship is working. The Holy Spirit comes alive in our life. That's how you know the relationship that's the power source. That's the hope that we have. That's where the freedom is found. But yet we look to Jesus to allow the Holy Spirit to come up. Does that make sense? So how does this work? Really quickly. We're going to cover the Holy Spirit in a lot more, more depth in the next series. But let's look what Galatians says really quickly about this. First, when we surrender to Jesus, the Holy Spirit adopts us. Galatians 4, 6, and 7. And because you are sons... God sent the Spirit of His Son, the Spirit of His Son, that's the Holy Spirit of His Son, into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son or a daughter, then God has made you an heir. So before we choose to follow Jesus, we're living as a slave. That's not freedom, right? Where are we living as a slave to? Our own demise. Because I don't know about you, but the more I realize, the more I live for myself, the more I want what I want, the better, the better, the worse of a husband I am, the worse grammar I am, the worse, the more I, I, I try to live for myself, I become selfish, self-absorbed, and, and I no longer live like I need to live. And it hurts not only me, but it hurts everyone else. That's what sin does. It reverberates through our world. But when we surrender to Jesus, when we look to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes in our life, and the Holy Spirit testifies to Jesus through the Father. The Father through Jesus. I said that backwards. Testifies to the Father through Jesus that we belong to Jesus. So it says, you're now an heir. You are a son or a daughter of the King. When you give your life to Jesus, you are a son or a daughter of the King. God does not make junk. You were created in His image your worth and your value, your freedom comes when you know that I was made this way, that I was, I'm glorifying God. And yes, sin comes in and teaches us that's a different story. But when we trust God's word and we align it 
with the way that we're supposed to live by surrendering and sacrificing and saying, God, how do you want me to live? That's when the Holy Spirit comes in. We are his sons or daughters. And the way this works is the Holy Spirit is our guide. Galatians 5, 16. I say then, walk by the Spirit and you will certainly not carry out the desires of the flesh. That sounds easy, right? We get to walk by the Spirit. And, and then we're no longer going to carry out the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh there means the impulses. Okay? But what does that look like? Verse 18. If you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. In other words, the law, the, the rules, is not where we find our freedom once again. But the Holy Spirit is our guide, and the law is designed like a boundary on the road in the Colorado Rocky Mountains to keep us from going off a cliff. Make sense? So, if you live with intention, if we learn to live with intention, the way that we know that God is alive in our life is allowing us to live with the Holy Spirit. Can I be really transparent with you? I don't know that most people in our churches today have been taught how to live within the Holy Spirit. Because we do it, once again, with the two extremes. We, we get kind of crazy with the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to badmouth anybody with that right now. I'm just being honest with you. Or we get taught as often in the circles that I grew up in is, oh, we don't talk about the Holy Spirit. Right? So Francis Chan, in his book called Forgotten God, describes the Holy Spirit as a very important measuring stick of how you're doing in your faith. And the way that you know you're growing, because healthy things grow, the way that you know you're content, the way that you know you're progressing in your faith, is by looking at the, how the Holy Spirit is alive in your life. So Galatians 5, 25 through 26, says the Holy Spirit is present with us in all aspects of our lives. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Let us not be uh, arrogant. If we live by the Spirit, we're walking with the Spirit. What happens in church a lot of times is we walk with the Spirit, and then we think we're better than we are, so we leave the Spirit behind, in a sense, and go, I know all the answers, I'm the holiest person. Have we ever known a pastor like that? Please don't say me, but although it's probably been me sometimes. Have we ever known people who are like, they think they're holy, but boy, I know how they are at home. Have we ever struggled? Well, none of us are going to be perfect. Come back next week. However, when we allow and teach ourselves to stay with the Holy Spirit more, it's like plugging into the power source. Here's an illustration, I think, that, that is dangerous for the way we've been taught to walk with the Holy Spirit. way we do it, every morning, get your Bible out. Drew had that big old Bible out last week, you know, like the big Bible. Had the big Bible out. You get your coffee cup, says John 3.16, or your favorite verse here. You Instagram the picture before you take it because you wonder when to know you're holy, right? And then what we think we're doing in that moment is we're plugging into the source to get our energy for the day, Right? And so we, we read God's word, and we're like, man, this is awesome. Holy Spirit, move. And then we close our Bible, and it's like we withdraw ourselves from the outlet, and we try to live the rest of the day on our own, hoping that there was enough in the tank to get us through. That's not scriptural. Yes. There is some intense in silence and solitude. There is some recharge that happens there. But when we unplug from there, it's like we need to have that little transporting power cable that we plug in and carry everywhere with us. Have you ever had your quiet time and three minutes later you're arguing with your husband or your wife? You ever had your quiet time and you're like, boom, text message, no, right? Have you to walk in step with the Holy Spirit says, my life is going to be measured by what the Holy Spirit wants for me. And so we have to train ourselves. Holy Spirit, move. When we're frustrated, Holy Spirit, move. 
We have, to, we have to teach ourselves, and the journey of following Christ, I believe, is learning how to progressively spend more and more time giving our hearts and our lives and our minds attention and our hearts affection to the Holy Spirit throughout the day. So that when the kids stomp their foot and say, I'm not taking a bath, I took one last week. We don't have to have a come to Jesus moment with them, right? We get to show them Jesus. When, when the boss rears his ugly disposition, that would never happen, right? We don't get frazzled because the joy of the Lord is in our hearts. So measure, pause before I even go anymore. How are you doing? How are you doing in, in teaching yourselves throughout the day? Lord, help me to stay in touch with you. Do you know how often I pray that throughout the day? Lord, help me to stay in touch. God, I even pray this quite often. Lord, right now I don't want to be holy, but I want to want to be holy. <laughs> Lord, right now I want to be angry, but I don't want to be angry, so help me not to want to be angry, right? And the measure of how we're doing that is found in some of the verses other than Genesis 1, 26 and 27 that we share in John 3, 16, we share more than anything else. The measure of the Holy Spirit's presence in our lives is the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Let those words soak over you and ask yourself. Give yourself a letter grade if you really want to. How am I doing in these? How are you doing with love? Unconditional love, not just because people love you back. How are you doing in joy? Are you just gr disgruntled? What would your spouse say if you're married? What would your roommate say in college? What would your school friends say about you? Are you a person of joy? Or are you, well, I'm a realist. You're a realist of pessimism? And negativity, you find your joy. What about peace? Well, you don't seem rattled by the situation. God's got it. What does that look like? I don't know. How can you have peace when you don't know? I have faith. I don't understand. I know. How do you not know? I don't know. But there's a peace that says God's got this in my life. A patience. This one's bad for me, y'all. When I make up my mind, I want to know immediately. God will go anywhere you want me to go. Tell me now. God, if you could just show me the next 20 years of my life, I'll be grateful. Aren't you glad he doesn't, by the way? What about kindness? Kindness is difficult to measure, like humility. If you think you're humble, you're probably not. Kindness, if you think you're kind, you're probably not. The best way to measure your kindness is to ask someone, am I kind? And if they go like this, goodness, the idea that you want the best for other people, faithfulness, that you're the same today, tomorrow, and yesterday, gentleness, do you stir up more animosity? But I'm just naturally a fighter. Some of you are naturally fighters, but you can be gentle in your correction and self-control. I'm not letting the emotions of other people, the actions of other people, I'm not letting the circumstances of my life and giving those reins to my heart to anyone else. The reins of my heart belong to the Holy Spirit, which is given to me by focusing on Jesus. Now, last one. Let me say it again. Are your emotions dictated by giving, you giving, you choosing to give the reins of your emotions to the circumstances of your life and other people? They may be mad, no, you got mad because you chose to get mad at their action. Are you giving the reins of your emotions to other people? Or in those moments, we all get angry, y'all. I've been in the South, y'all. Are you giving those reins to other people or to God? And so when you start feeling that anger, I need to get alone with God. God, I, right now I want to be angry, but I don't want to want to be angry. This is how it looks like. So the result of that is you live those things out, and the result of walking by the Holy Spirit is that we will in turn sow the seeds of the Holy Spirit in others. 
Y'all, the Holy Spirit is designed to be more contagious than any COVID variant that ever existed. Right? Let the one who has taught the word share all those good things with the teacher. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a person sows, he will also reap. Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. The more you live for yourself, the more you're going to reap problems for yourself. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. So let us not get tired of doing good. For we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the house of faith. You will reap what you sow. Let's be real. Anybody can fake it in the world. You want to really measure how you're doing with the Holy Spirit? Ask those you live with. I don't want to do that. Okay. None of us will be perfect. Come back next week. (laughs) But the idea of what we're supposed to be about is let Lord, make more and more of me like you. Here's our very simple daily training this week. Seek to know Jesus more deeply and allow the Holy Spirit to work and move into you. You don't have to seek after the Holy Spirit. You seek after Jesus, the Holy Spirit will come alive. If you try to earn love, if you try to earn grace, if you try to earn kindness, if you try to be faithful, yeah, you can do that for a little while, but ultimately you're going to burn out. But when you chase after the presence of Jesus, those things will naturally come. You can't be holy on your own, by definition. It's fake. Fall in love with Jesus. If you've never given your life to Jesus, we'd love for you to do that there. We'd love for you to come forward at the end of the service and talk to one of us and say, man, I want to know Jesus. You can go to yourcalvary.info and fill out the baptism card and we'll follow up with you there. So I don't know everything to put. Just put, talk to me. Talk to me. Every, every required space. and we'll, we'll get in touch with you. Christian, don't take this lightly. Learn to walk and dwell in the Holy Spirit. Don't just plug in in the morning or plug in at night for 10 minutes and hope that gets you through. Learn to carry Jesus with you throughout the day. I want to close by just talking a little bit more about freedom that's what this is about, Galatians 5. As we walk in the Holy Spirit, here's where we find freedom. For freedom, Christ set us free. Stand then, and don't submit any more to a yoke of slavery. Freedom! Now, when I say freedom, we usually think of one of two things. Patriotic or Braveheart. <laughs> freedom! Right? Shouldn't we as Christians find our freedom in Christ? Let's take back that word for Christ. The freedom we have comes. God loves me for where I am. The freedom has when I find the worth and the value that I am the son of the king. You are a daughter. You are a queen. A princess at least in his eyes. You were made in the image of God and no one can take that away. Oh, Lord, take the reins. Lord, in this moment, would you move? God, in this moment, would you have your worth and your value fall down on us? God, I ask right now for your continued presence in here. Forgive us, God, when we make this about ourselves instead of you. So right here, right now, Holy Spirit, move. Like the morning dew, fall on us. Not just to energize us, but God, help us to know how to take that presence with us when we go. And when we mess up, repent and get back up again. Father, you are so good. For you are holy and wise and just, faithful, kind. You are loving and patient. You are generous. You are abundant peace. 
You are tranquility in the storm. You are our everything. It's in your holy name we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you stand with us? Let's see this. The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light. In the kingdom of light. Forever under your dominion. You're the king of my life. You're the king of my life. You reign above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart. There is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. On the cross, the word. God, you poured out your life just to give us new life. Now from the lips of the forgiven, here in anthem arise, Jesus, you're sent the darkness running in the name of Jesus. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running.
sing now, let's sing now. You reign above it all, you reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart, there is no hiding it. Jesus, you reign above it all. Let all of heaven and the earth erupt in song. Sing hallelujah to the everlasting one. There is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. Greater is the one who's in us. Calls our name, he will never fail. Stronger is the one within us, stronger is the one who fights for us. He will never fail, he will never fail. For your 
grace that Jesus has offered away. As we rest of the back on. Oceans of kindness, wave after wave. Mercy arrives. good to us. Undeserved. Amen. Amen. Well, this concludes our service. I'm going to pray for us here in a moment. If you're new here, you may have not heard me say this, but we say it every week. We would love to pray for you. We'll be down here at the front if you would like uh, to receive prayer from one of our prayer team members here. Connect with us. If, if this is your first time, we'd love to just chat with you. And so find a staff member, find someone in the halls, let them know it's your first time and we'll get in touch with you. Let's pray together. Father, we need you today. That grace that we spoke about and sang about may be felt in a week to come here as we offer it to a world in need. May the Holy Spirit call to mind times where we can press into those fruit, that evidence of the gospel saturated in our life. So lead us this week, Lord, we need you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You are dismissed.